All right, y'all, let's talk about state building in the Americas from 1200 to 1450. Uh, these are the key questions. There's not a ton. Uh, I always find it disappointing there's not more key questions on this one, that there's not more learning objectives to really focus on on this one. Um, but you know what? We're still going to have fun anyway. We're still going to learn a whole bunch of stuff. Also, I just want to point out, is this guy, is this a guy hugging a trash can? Do you see where my mouse is? I, like, is that a man? I can't tell. I've never noticed it before, but I started to record this video and I was like, it really looks like that's a person hugging a trash can. I hope they're okay. All right, let's get rolling. Uh, you're going to start off doing this quiz where you kind of know some of the modern day places within the Americas. The reason we do these quizzes is of, of um, modern locations is because oftentimes in the lecture, I'm referencing a modern country or state. And if you don't know where that is, me referencing it is kind of useless. Um, so just do your best. You will not on the AP exam, you absolutely will not have to label things on a map. That's not going to be a thing. You will have maps put in front of you though. And if you can recognize what some of those places are, it will make it easier to use the map as a stimulus. Um, or if there's a map on the document-based question, those things will really help you out. So let's talk about the Mayans. Now, this is another one of those times because this unit is just a, a, a big hot mess. I love it though, because there's just so much you get to learn. Um, or we're gonna learn about stuff that's before the year 1200 in order to give ourselves some historical context. So the Mayans are gonna reach their height around 250 to 900 CE. Location is gonna be Southern Mexico, Belize, and Guatemala. Most lived in or near one of what we think is at least 40 large cities. And these cities would house 5,000 to 50,000 people in each city. The government was a city state. So each city is ruled by a king. The city and its surrounding territory is ruled by this king. When there's no male heir that was old enough, this is actually one of the places where we see women governing um, and ruling if there's no male heir old enough to rule. Wars were super common between the city-states. They fought mostly to gain tribute, which would be payments for conquering. We see the tribute system in China. We're going to see it elsewhere in the world as well. Those captured often used as human sacrifice and religious ceremonies. Listen, we're going to see this theme of human sacrifice in the Americas, particularly in Central and Southern America. Um, and it's awful. It's terrible. It's really, really bad. Uh, but, but as a reminder, like, everyone was doing really, really bad, terrible things. So let's not fully judge these societies based on this one really bad thing they did. Because if we did that, we would have no societies to look to and admire. Um, I'm not advocating for human sacrifice. I want to make that really clear. So the king claimed to be descended from a god and directed the activities of the elites, the priests and scribes. There's no standing army, which is really interesting. So when war happened, the king just kind of expected the citizens to fight. Um, and there's no centralized government when we look at these uh, regions. They were really innovative, though, in science and technology. They're going to incorporate the concept of zero. Remember, the Americas have no contact with Afro-Eurasia at this point. So that is something they come up with on their own. They develop a really complex writing system. They learn to make rubber from collecting liquid from rubber plants. And so science and religion were linked through astronomy. And it was based on a calendar. Priests would determine when to hold religious ceremonies and when to go to war. And they also made really precise observations from the top of pyramids. And they had a more precise calendar than Europe did at the equivalent time. What's so interesting to me about these observations they're making from the tops of the pyramids that they've built is they, they don't have telescopes. They're just observing the sky and still getting really precise information about how the universe works. The Mexica are a group that were migrants from the Northwest. They're going to go on to build the alliance that we know of as the Aztec Empire. They arrive in central Mexico around 1200. Um, they were known for kidnapping women and seizing land cultivated by others, which was not the best reputation to have. For a century or so, they migrated around central Mexico. Also, think about it. The seizing land that's already been farmed by somebody else is actually a pretty brilliant move because you don't have to do all the work. The work's already been done for you. The land's all set up to farm. It's got stuff growing on it. It's, it's tactically brilliant. Um, around 1345, the Mexica are going to settle on an island in a marshy region known as Texcoco. The island becomes Tenochtitlan, which becomes their capital city. It had a lake around it that had plenty of fish and frogs and waterfowl. They're going to dredge the lake for fertile muck. So what that means is they're pulling up the muck and the mud from the bottom of the lake. And they're using that in order to fertilize 
their agriculture. It's pretty brilliant because there's so many nutrients in that muck at the bottom of the lake. They're going to plant on plots of land that we want to think of as like floating gardens. They weren't actually floating, but they looked like they were floating because they would um, they'd stack up the soil until the soil went above the water level, basically making little islands to grow on. Um, and so it looked like these gardens would look like floating gardens all throughout the lake. They used a canal system to get water from lake to plots of lands. They protected, uh, it was protected on all sides by water, this capital city, and the Mexico warriors patrolled the caseways or the ways that you could get in and out. <laughs> I'm so sorry if you can hear my cats fighting in the background. They're playing. They're not fighting, they're playing. By the 15th century, the Mexico were incredibly powerful. They start to overcome neighbors and demand tribute from new subjects. They're gonna launch campaigns of imperial expansion. And we see some of the leaders lead these conquering campaigns to Oaxaca where they slayed inhabitants and left colonists behind to rule, um, which is really what we, when we talk about an empire, that's what we're talking about is a country or a, 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 a government going out, taking over another place and leaving people behind to rule that place. They're going to conquer more land around the Gulf Coast as well. By the mid 15th century, they're going to be allied with two neighboring cities, and it's going to create the Triple Alliance that is what we truly refer to as the Aztec Empire. The, they're going to rule, um, the Aztec Empire is going to be ruled by the Mexica and Tenochtitlan. They will rule over 12 million people and most of Mesoamerica. The main reason for the alliance was to get tribute from those they ruled, food, knives, rabbit fur blankets, jewelry, embroidered cloth. The Aztec did not have a bureaucracy and they did not change local governments when they took over. Um, they simply conquered and used force to collect tribute. So they did not even have a standing army. They put together forces as needed. I'd like you to take a moment and look at the map and think, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Mexica society and culture, more info survives about the Mexica than any other pre-Columbian Americas groups. The, one of the reasons for this is they had extensive writing and documentation. And another reason is Spanish priests are going to interview the Mexica like extensively and write a lot of books about their interactions with the, um, with the Aztec and the Mexica. So we know that their social structure had a strict hierarchy with military elite towards the top. You could rise up by doing really well on the battlefield, but most military elite came from the aristocracy. Lobel birth, noble birth, noble birth, that wasn't a word, means well-trained. Um, warriors were given land, they were given the best food, and elite warriors were on the council that selected rulers and filled government positions. Dress reflected their social status. So we see that there were laws in place that made it so commoners had to wear coarse fabrics, but warriors and aristocrats could wear these bright colors and many wore capes and eagle feathers and they were really heavily adorned. Women could not inherit property and they had to listen to fathers and husbands, you know, the patriarchy, uh, but they could sell crafts at market. They could earn the respect as mother of warriors. They, they could own some jobs and make some money. They just couldn't inherit property and they were still needed to be subservient to um, the males within their life. An interesting way that they could rise up in society, though, was by childbearing was seen as being equal to a warrior going to battle. And if they had a if they gave birth to someone who became a warrior, that elevated them even more. Priests were ranked among the elite in the Mexica culture. They were educated in the calendar and ritual lore. They presided over religious ceremonies that were seen as crucial to the world continuing. And they had considerable influence on leaders and rulers. Some leaders were even priests who rose up to power. Cultivators and slaves, when we talk about most people are gonna be commoners and they're gonna be cultivating the land and fields and that were allocated to their families. They're gonna live um, and harvest in small clans that are organized that organized their own affairs, allocate property to individual families within the clan, and then had to pay tribute of what was cultivated to the, the king in, um, in the city state. Slavery, mostly families would sell younger members into servitude, and then those younger members of the family would work as domestic servants. And artisans and merchants had, artisans had a really high status. They created beautiful things for the elite, but merchants were often considered greedy and they were frequently extorted. 
The Mexicans spoke a language that predates them as a society and was common in the region. They're going to adopt common cultural ideas from Mesoamerica, like a ball game played in formal courts, a 365-day solar calendar, and a 260-day ritual calendar. The Mexica were polytheistic, and they absorbed the religious beliefs common to Mesoamerica, such as common gods. They did practice ritual bloodletting, which was based on the belief that the gods had set the world in motion through acts of individual sacrifice. So Mexica priests re regularly performed acts of self-sacrifice, such as piercing their earlobes with cactus spines. The Mexica also engaged in human sacrifice. They believe it was essential for the world's sur survival. Some who were sacrificed were criminals, some were tributes from the places they were ruling or from neighboring peoples, some were people that were captured in battles. They believed that the blood sacrifice would sustain the sun and ensure moisture for the earth. So they truly saw these sacrifices as essential for the world continuing on. I'm going to go through here and I'm going to soapstone it. I'm going to drink some water before I tell you about North America. All right. When we talk about North America, we want to think about the Pueblo and the Navajo societies. They're going to be found in the American Southwest. Hey, that's where we live. They're going to use um, river water for irrigation, and they're going to be able to settle in agricultural communities and, and really settle down and build up communities. Some examples would be Mesa Verde, which they built multi-story multi homes into the sides of cliffs using bricks made of sandstone. Uh, the Chaco, they built a large log ray. I have a typo there. They built large housing structures using stone and clay, and some of these buildings had hundreds of rooms. The Iroquois people are a really interesting group. They had large-scale ag agriculture, and their society was east of the Mississippi River. The women were in charge of the villages and the longhouses, and longhouses is a, a structure where several families lived together. And the men were responsible for things beyond the village, hunting, fishing, and warfare. The Iroquois Confederacy was a confederation or an organization of Native American Indians, which was originally composed of five different tribes. And they're actually the oldest living democracy on earth because each of those tribes would send in representatives and make decisions together. The Mississippian people were builders of huge mounds that were monumental structures. At its height, we see around 15 to 38,000 people living around one of these places, which was Chahokia. They had organized social classes. The chief called the Great Sun ruled each town. Below him were the priests, nobles, and then a lower class of farmers, hunters, merchants, and artisans. They had a matrilineal society, which meant social standing was actually determined by the women's side of the family. So the social standing would go from mother to child. It's unknown exactly what caused the downfall, but the downfall appears to have begun around 1450. None of these societies had writing systems, but evidence shows that there was long distance trade that occurred. Now, I know that this picture looks like it's just grassy hills, but these are actually big monumental architectural pieces that were built. You can go see them in present day Illinois. When we talk about South America, if we look at around 12th century, we see a kingdom dominating the highlands of what is now modern day Peru and Bolivia near, uh, near this lake. And depending, uh, they depended on potatoes and herding llamas, my favorite. And the llamas are going to provide meat, they're going to provide wool, they're going to use their dung as fuel to heat fires. They built elaborate terraced fields out of stone with, with stone retaining walls, which when we talk about terraced farming, that's when they cut into the hillside to create more farmland. In the lowlands, we see a powerful kingdom begin to expand and dominate and large thriving economy with vast irrigation networks. Now the Inca people are gonna to migrate to the highlands around that lake around mid 13th century, and they'll live peacefully with those already living there. But around 1438, Pachacuti is going to set out a series of military campaigns to expand the Inca Empire. And by the late 15th century, the Incas had an empire stretching over 2,500 miles. The Inca will end up ruling 11.5 million people through military and administrative elites. Armies were mostly made up of conquered people. And to maintain authority, the Inca would actually take hostages from ruling classes of the places they took over, force those hostages to live in 
the Inca capital. If people became uncooperative, the Inca would send um, loyal subjects to go rule those areas with a little bit more force. Pachacuti invented the administrative system used by the Inca, implemented taxes to support rulers, organized state-owned storehouses of food and products, and constructed extensive networks of roads for the military. Now, when we talk about the taxes, they used a really interesting system called the MITA system, M-I-T-A, where one of the forms of taxation was that people had to give a certain amount of physical labor to the Inca empire every single year. It's one of the ways they were able to maintain the roads that they had, the really extensive road network, some of the irrigation, um, and those storehouses of food that we see. You're going to take a look at this document and figure out what does it tell you about the Inca empire. Now, there's no script or system of writing that was left behind by the Inca uh, empire, but we do have Quipu, which is this way of tra keeping track of things through tying knots in rope. Um, for the most part, we don't 100% know how to translate what's going on here. Uh, though a student recently, a few years ago, at a university thinks that they might have cracked the code to it. And then Cusco served as the administrative, religious, and ceremonial center. Long distance trade fell under the control of the government and the state didn't really allow people to become independent merchants. Mostly you had to barter for what you needed. I don't know what my cat is eating. My cat is eating something. I think I have to go save my cat. I think it's okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. These videos, man. Oh, this is why I'll never be a YouTube star. Go ahead and analyze this document. Explore Machu Picchu. And the social classes in the Inca society, rulers were considered um, a descendant of the sun. It seems to be a common theme. It was an absolute ruler. The god king owned all of the land, all of the livestock, all of the property in the Inca realm. Inca rulers were mummified and their royal remains were seen as intermediaries with the god. So their mummified remains would stick around. So um, the next ruling, uh, the next ruler, the next god, not God, the next king, God King was what I was reading when I said that, could communicate with that mummified remains in the hopes that the mummified remains of the previous king would send that message up to the gods for him. Um, oh, I just realized what my cat is eating. Okay, he's okay. It's just paper. <laughs> he's going to be okay. Aristocats and priests, uh, we're going to see, I think I just said aristocats instead of aristocrats because I was talking about my cat. Priests often came from aristocratic families who lived really privileged lives, Lives, priests were influential, highly educated, and responsible for overseeing religious ceremonies. Most people were peasants who lived in small communities and supported themselves through working the land. They paid tax through compulsory labor service by the construction of roads and irrigation. And like many other places we've looked at in the Americas, they're going to believe in multiple gods with religious followings behind them. The most important god being the sun god. And the cult of the sun was based in Cusco and had 4,000 priests and attendees. The temples were full of gold and jewels. Constructed my cat is just demolishing things behind me. Um, constructed for the gods. Animal sacrifices were common, and they also had a concept of sin in many of their religious traditions. They believed it would bring divine disaster for both the individual and the larger community if people did things that were wrong. And that is the end. You're going to do some similarities and differences, and uh, you can choose any two societies you've learned about to compare. That's it. That's all you got. We did it. We did it. Look at us.